Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. I've done about 395 of them now, and uh, if this happens to be new to you, go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and look under the past interviews menu where you'll find them all categorized in several different ways. This show is made possible by the support of appreciative listeners and viewers, and um, if you appreciate it and feel like supporting it, there are donate buttons on the site. So thank you for that, and thanks to those who have been supporting it. Um, my guest today is Pamela Wilson. I've interviewed her before, about six years ago, um, and I've always wanted to do another one with her, so here we are. Uh, Pamela celebrates 20 years of being on the road worldwide, sharing truth, clarity, love, and the joy of being. Her new book, The Golden Retriever's Guide to Joy, is a distillation of everything she has noticed within regarding the book of life <clears throat> within stillness. She delights in getting to the heart of the matter, literally, finding the intelligent presence within all forms and functions, and then showing it uh, its true nature so that emotion, <coughs> sensation, the body, and the mind can also return and stabilize as balanced, rooted spaciousness. Join the fun. Life is simple within its complexity. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you, Pamela. Um, so, I, I have a feeling, I may be wrong, but that you kind of had it in mind to write a book for quite some time, and you weren't getting around to it, and finally you thought, why not just let the dog write it? There you go. Is that what happened? There you go. <laughs> yes, it's it's sort of like the lazy girl's guide to um, publishing and writing. Yeah. They need to earn their keep. Yeah, they need to earn their keep. Aaron. It's sort of the opposite of the dog ate the homework. It's the dog did the homework. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> now I wish she could carry some groceries. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you uh, buy into the notion? We'll talk more about the book as we go along, but. Do you um, resonate with the idea that um, there's really no end to spiritual evolution, that there's no sort of terminus point? We just keep on keeping on, keeping on, keep on evolving. <laughs> I thought you were going to say we just keep on trucking. We do that too, yeah. Yeah. Mr. Natural. Well, as far as I can tell, um, since the nature of everything is infinite, there is mm -hmm. an infinite amount to notice. Um, about reality so it's i find it still uh, very stimulating and very thrilling and and if i miss something then somebody in one of the groups has noticed something and when they speak of it then it i go oh that resonates mm -hmm. so this may be a tough question to answer but um since we spoke about six years ago um would it be possible that if you could contrast what your experience was six years ago with what it is now, would you be able to say anything about that? How, how have you grown in six years? Um, I could say that, you know, it's apparently life keeps weaning us off of subtle identifications. So when I first had the shift um, almost 20 years ago, I was living as awareness or um, a joyous heart and I still the embodiment was still shakeable mm. and then um, that sort of subtle identification is of I am or I am awareness fell away and then there was just this um, rooted spaciousness that was a lot less shakeable so I'm very happy to be living that <laughs> so in other words you aside from certain traffic situations uh, <laughs> you uh, you know you don't get per per perturbed easily well sometimes it's the little things isn't that weird mm. i don't know if you notice that but yeah, it uh, can be yeah and then i'm you know one of if somebody was to ask me what is one of my um remaining sorrows it would be the non-love in the human conditioning. So that sometimes can really um, uh, affect and come sit with the heart and devastate it sometimes. And you don't on, only mean your own personal human condition, you mean the uh, humanity, right? What, yeah, What goes exactly. on in the world. As, ooh, just open the news. Mm. Yeah. 
Well, that's it. I want to talk to you about that as we go along, because I heard you make some comments in some of your in other interviews that I thought were insightful about sort of the world situation and all. And, and speaking of other interviews, um, in preparing for this one, I listened to several you did. One with somebody named Lucia or Lucia or something like that. Oh, with, yeah, Lucia Renee. She's lovely. Yeah, I thought that was very good. And, and um, our, our previous one was, was an interesting conversation like six years ago. Mm -hmm. You also did a nice one with Renata McNay. So, mm -hmm. you know, if people enjoy this and want to hear some other ones, they'll find on your website links, links to those other interviews. They were good. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, yeah, about embodiment, you you, uh, you said, and I think it might have been your interview with Lucia, Lucia Renee, you said, after awakening, you felt angelic and not human for about 10 years. Then you came back down to earth, something like that. <laughs> I think I crashed. Yeah? <laughs> it's the classic sort of, um, the classic fall to earth. Mm. You yep. know, flew myth. too close to the sun. Yeah. Icarus. Well, no, it wasn't about that. It was more that I think life weans us off of the felt sense of divinity. And there was a little bit of whining with that. Hmm. What's wrong? Why would life want to do that? What's wrong with the felt sense of divinity? Well, as far as I can tell, there's something deeper, mm -hmm. which is elemental being. Hmm. And um, that is more stable. Because I think, for me, human, humanness and divinity, they're a polarity. Mm -hmm. So anytime I find a polarity, I like to look behind or underneath or in between. Or mm. What that triggers in my understanding is that, uh, you know, the, the divine or the celestial realm is wonderful and subtle and beautiful, but it's not necessarily the, the bedrock. It's not the ultimate. Exactly. Yeah. It's not the substratum, yeah. Yeah. I mean, even in the Vedic literature, they say, well, you know, you, the denizens of heaven um, aren't necessarily enlightened. They, they just enjoy that. They're having a lot of fun, though. Yeah, they earn, they <laughs> earn some good karma or something. They go and they, they live it, and, but they eventually have to come back and, yeah. and, uh, for final liberation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but that's interesting because very often people have some kind of shift into an impersonal, abstract, absolute kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, but and then maybe later on, or maybe not, but maybe later on they develop some kind of more appreciation of divinity and celestial qualities and so on. With mm -hmm. you, it almost sounds like you're saying it happened the other way around? Yeah, it was, it was, I was just um, kind of living the big love and noticing the love within everything. Mm -hmm. And so there was just joy. Nice. That sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. And our, now, uh, now I could say I'm living a sober joy. Mm. Yeah. Was anything lost, or do you feel like the the container just got bigger, and and the joy thing is still there, but it's in a larger context? Yeah, it is, but and now it's very informed. It's um, before it was like blithe spirit, you know that phrase, uh -huh. and now it's um, it's kind of wiser. Mm. Maybe because you're getting older. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I'm kind of reminded of our, what our friend Adyashanti often says about awakening in the head, heart, and gut. And he probably didn't think that up. Probably others have said it, but um, it's not. They don't always necessarily go in any particular order. I find you know, yeah. among people. And with you, maybe it sounds like heart first, and then yeah, heart first, um, then the head. It was very funny one day. I talked to stillness occasionally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not that I'm not that, but I asked it, hey, you know, I'm, I'm present with the mind, I, I gaze at it, I'm ah, compassionate with it, why hasn't it come to rest? Because it'll come to rest and open mm -hmm. and be quiet, but then it'll, you know, wind itself all up. And it said, oh, you didn't show it its true nature. Mm. And so and then I, you know, I just honored... <clears throat> Mm. consciousness within 
you know, the pure intelligence within the mind and it relaxed open and then I invited it just to root and stabilize as that. So that was a nice clue from stillness that it's not just being with or gazing or watching thought like waves come and go. You really, out of compassion, you have to show it its true nature. Mm -hmm. And you did that how? Just by honoring it and then inviting it to look behind its files and forms and functions and ideas. Hmm. I've heard you say a lot of things like that in uh, interviews, like using a lot of verbs with regard to things like fear or jealousy or the mind or, you know, this and that. You, say, you use words like honor or bow or mm -hmm. invite and, and all sorts of things like that. And, it, you know, I don't... No, personally, I don't quite get how to put that into practice. Mm, it's, it's more it seems like the somehow. heart bowing mm -hmm. and noticing the restlessness or the remaining suffering in some of these crystallizations of consciousness. So um, the universal language, other than stillness, is respect. And this I got from Papaji. Somebody asked him to sum up his teachings. And he said, look within, approach everything with devotion and gratitude, and then stay as heart. Hmm. So I tried that, approaching everything with devotion and gratitude. And we already are that, but when you add a little extra warmth, it really um, allows the embodiment to self-liberate. Hmm. So would you describe what you're saying as a sort of a, a subtle intentional shift, like just sort of rather than being oblivious to some inner workings, rather just sort of gently put the attention here, have this little mm. bit of subtle recognition and so on, and then that kind of enlivens things? Yeah, it's like uh, treating everything as the inner sangha inside, mm -hmm. the inner gathering, because any restlessness is just looking for rest. Mm. And anything that's suffering is looking for the ultimate resolution, which is true nature. So let me press you on this a little bit more. So let's say a person is angry or restless or mm. depressed or something like that, rather than just sort of taking that for granted, I'm angry because of, uh, you know, is it, are you suggesting a little bit more of an introspective thing like, okay, now why is this arising? And, you know, what's the well, root of this depression and so on? No, it's it's not why or looking at the root, it's looking into the essence uh -huh. because we can get really caught, as you've noticed, as humanity has gotten really caught in the whys. Mm -hmm. Why is this happening to me? <laughs> <laughs> and um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, beautiful invitations in psychology and, and many things, but this is simple looking into the heart of the matter looking into the essence of anger, what's the essence of anger, mm -hmm. and then honoring that, because the essence of everything, you know, um, are, is qualities of life or stillness or... And I, I'm, I'm asking dumb questions because I'm dumb, and I want, <laughs> <laughs> and I want to make sure everybody gets this. Um, uh -huh. So let's say, okay, I'm walk, going through my day, and something gets stirred up, and mm -hmm. I think, oh, Pamela said, look into the essence of this. How do I yeah. do that? Do I sit down and close my eyes? Do I, what do I do? Well, it's nice. You can do it on the fly, too. You can, you know, once again, noticing the felt sense, you know, say if it's reactivity or some <clears throat> irritation, just, just feeling into that. Mm -hmm. And then noticing, for me, the second movement is to notice usually there's too much of it to be personal. It's like anger isn't personal or reactivity or the felt sense of separation. These are all, lately I'm calling them apps, but they're, that's kind of rude. It's, <laughs> it's really the colors of consciousness. In that moment, there's a watercolor wash of fiery anger through the stillness or through the openness getting curious wow what is that that rather than just taking it for granted or assuming it's justifiable or whatever there's just a little bit of a yeah because then it, of it, it doesn't 
it's coming at this point not to offer role play services because before as actors or um, we really needed that kind of backup that those points of view those kind of like righteous opinions and then we're convincing mm -hmm. but now it's coming it's all coming for freedom yeah I'm, I, for some reason the, something the Sagadatta said just popped into my mind he, he talked to us about the the ability of, to appreciate paradox and ambiguity being kind of characteristic of spiritual maturity and that that to me means not just assuming that you know my way or the highway that my viewpoint is is right and everybody else and any, who, anyone who differs with it is wrong but just sort of taking the broader view and and recognizing that you know we're all we've all just got a, a fraction or a fragment of, of the, the, pic, the total picture. Yes, yes. And then it's then, you know, this is curiosity's own pleasure, mm -hmm. you know, to look into the nature of everything, to, to notice the formlessness in all forms and functions and be curious. And that's how it informs itself, as we've all noticed, is through curiosity. Yeah. Um, one thing I saw, I guess, I don't know if uh, any survey has ever been done, it'd be interesting, of, of, of all the people who are in this world that you and I <laughs> travel in, you know, all the <laughs> spiritual seekers and the teachers and the satsangs and all this stuff around the world. But I wonder, it'd be interesting to see a breakdown of um, how many people actually practice something, how many mainly just read books or just listen <laughs> to teachers. And, and um, you know, I know that you've done a lot of practice in various ways, uh, TM mm -hmm. for years, uh, the Sedona mm -hmm. Method, mm -hmm. Lester Levinson, and working with Robert Adams and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing that I worry about sometimes is that people who, and, and there are teachers who explicitly discourage practice of any kind, uh, you know, they say it's a waste of time or it, it just reinforces the practicer. Um, I'm, a lot of times when I hear, a lot of times I'm concerned that people are just sort of picking up a lot of words, listening to things, and, mm -hmm. and, and they mistake that for the actual realization. What's your emphasis or orientation on this issue? Well, to me, the, the um, field of presence, you know, is, is the body. Uh -huh. In, you know, so if we live above the nose, you know, maybe our recognition can be conceptual, but if it, um, if presence and naturalness or life permeates its own embodiment down to its toes, then it's the living truth. Mm -hmm. And I like to honor everyone's... Um, Inclinations? Yeah, because the, they're following their resonance. It's usually genuine passion. Mm -hmm. Even a good Dharma debate can have genuine passion in it, so... I mean, I, I really try not to mess with anybody's... Um... Yeah, and one thing tends to lead to the next. Yeah. They, they may be doing something now, but after a while they might think, hey, you know, I think I'll try that or whatever. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. We're, we're all really just following our feet, mm -hmm. you know. That's a good point. Um, I heard you quote Robert Adams and perhaps others in, in emphasizing the value of being able to sit with someone who is really grounded, or whatever word he used, you know, really <laughs> established, uh, and that, that that could be, you know, orders of magnitude more powerful than than other options if you have that opportunity. Yeah. Maybe good good to address that for a moment. Yeah, that was my experience. I had, um, as you know, done the TM, and then twelve years of the Sedona method, and Lester passed away, and Laura. Lucille, who's Francis's wife nice. now, Francis Lucille's wife, she told me about Robert, uh -huh. and I just walked into this gathering in uh, Los Angeles area, and oh, it was like hitting a wall of peace. Yeah. But a soft, welcoming, and I just sat down, and it was the first time I hadn't mantraed or released or done any practice. <laughs> It was such a relief. Yeah. I could just rest and savor and be permeated and soothed. It was like heaven. Right. 
could be that all your mantra-ing and Sedona-ing had, had actually made you more... Oh, definitely, yeah. definitely. Open and to it. And it really clarified, you know, the mind, the tendencies, the, you know, emotional <clears throat> habits. Just very beautiful. I'm very grateful for all of it. Yeah. yeah. I feel that way, too. It's sort of like each thing we do. It's like I'm, I'm grateful for second grade, you know. I, I didn't stay there, <laughs> but I had a really good teacher in second grade. And, oh. uh, you know, and a really good teacher in sixth grade. Each, each thing was a step of progress. So, yeah. you know, I think everybody gets the metaphor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. um, so let's talk about your book a little bit. Um, you mentioned that you ran into Eckhart Tolle up in Vancouver and uh, you had your dog with you. And he said, do you know your dog is enlightened? And you said, yes, she woke up before me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Neelam actually did the beautiful... Um, touching of the right hand on the right side of the chest and the left hand on the head that Ramana had gifted his mother and uh -huh. a few people with um, and drawing the eye thought out of the head back into the heart. So that was a few few months before I woke up. So Honey, my dog, was the living embodiment of love and peace and stillness and strength. Huh. Okay, now, you know, I have a video of, of me holding our dog, Shanti, who has since mm -hmm. passed away, Sweet. and mm -hmm. Ama coming up and hugging and kissing and blessing and, you know, doing all this <laughs> wonderful stuff with, with Shanti. Um, oh. But I don't mean to sound like a curmudgeon, but I wouldn't go so far as to say that Shanti became enlightened in the sense that, you know, human beings become enlightened. I mean, she still liked to roll and cat poop or eat it or you know stuff like that she was still a dog you know so it kind of begs the question can a, are we being kind of um just poetical here or could a, a no but we could also say that there's many sages that have had their shift and everything and still have strange tendencies <laughs> true <laughs> uh, no i in this case i have to say I wouldn't say that about my current dog, but I would definitely say it about Honey. Hmm. There is something, um, and it makes sense because all beings have true nature. The Great Sutra in Buddhism is all beings have Buddha nature. Sure. Yeah. Inclu so it, um, yeah, including mosquitoes and, and amoebas <laughs> and everything. It's just a question of where we want to draw the line, you know. I don't want to get too academic. I mean, who knows? About I know, I know. But it's interesting to ponder because... There's a thing that Ken Wilber talks about called the pre-trans fallacy where we, you know, look at babies or animals and they seem like they have a lot of qualities that we would associate with enlightenment, but it, they have to go through a whole minefield of, of development before they kind of get to the other side and, and then re yeah. regain those qualities but have something so much more. I would say it's not a minefield, it's a mind, mind field, field right? <laughs> we all have to go through. Yeah. You know, kind of like the mind un encumbers itself and then gets clarified back to its original pure intelligence. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm all for all beings knowing their true nature. That would be great. Yeah. Living it. It would be a different world. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, in, in a way, the whole spiritual evolution thing kind of recapitulates human maturation. You know, we, we're all innocent and cute and everything, and then we become teenagers. <laughs> you know? And, uh, you know, we get wild and crazy and do dangerous things. And, uh, but we sort of have to go through that because we're gaining our independence, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and our freedom and our autonomy. And then ho if we make it through that, then hopefully we, we become, you know, come out the other side uh, more mature, more whole, more established. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah. Okay, enough of that. What a long, strange trip it's been. Yeah, grateful ah. dad. Um, and continues to be. <laughs> <laughs> so let's take some points from your book here. Um, there's a bunch of interesting things. So um, let's let's take. I'm just going to take some chapter titles and and let you talk about them, okay? Mm. And I'll try not to talk as much, I'm talking too much. Um, one is, 
who are you really? Yeah. Yeah, that's the, the final teachings in all traditions is to look into our essence rather than our persona or role or projections from others, who they think we are, who our mind thinks we are, and just looking, just turning around inside this natural aware presence looks within. And sometimes we have to soothe the body-mind enough so that we can look kind of behind the waves or the movements into this still innocent, intelligent presence that oddly enough has not been harmed or that it's whole and complete and still present and then in just inviting it to uncontain itself because part of the play of life in the natural world and in the human tribe is to protect, defend, veil that which is precious and a treasure. So mm. that to me is the most important thing, knowing, noticing that we're not just our body, we're not our thoughts, we're not the movements of the emotions, we're not our personal history. And in that moment, there's this just, oh, thank God. Because <laughs> there's beautiful moments that we all can remember, but there was a lot of pressure and harshness and confusion and longing to return back to something simpler and truer. Mm. And I think most people intuitively know that that's there. And, you know, mm -hmm. the polls have shown that the majority of people have had some sort of mystical experience or insight yeah. or something. And yeah. we, all, we all have this intuitive knowing. Yeah. So it's a very specific guided meditation so that it's a kinesthetic, stabilized knowing in the body in that chapter. Yeah, right. And I should add that your, your book isn't yet for sale, but there's going to be a thing on your website where people can just sign up to be notified when it mm -hmm. becomes available, right? Yes, yes. Okay, good. And it's not a long book. You can read it in less than an hour. It has some real nice illustrations of honey in it, honey, honey mm -hmm. the dog. Yeah, by my friend Kathleen, who's a very talented watercolorist. Yeah, nice. Um, okay, I'm just going to throw some chapter titles at you and let you talk, mm -hmm. let them stimulate discussion. So another one is Liberating the Mind. Oh, yes. This is probably the greatest gift we can give humanity. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> when we all went to school, we just had sky mind. We had this open field of bright, shiny intelligence in the head that was curious. And it had, um, it loved what it loved, still does, doesn't like what it doesn't like. And it, you know, it loves learning. It loves being curious. So, but in school, it was taught to concentrate and focus. And that's a gorgeous capacity. That's our um, zoom lens, really. But it, then it forgot its wide angle naturalness. So in that chapter is just a very simple way to sh show it. And for it to stabilize back into wide angle, pure intelligence, practical, creative. Mm. Yeah, this theme comes up a lot actually in various interviews. There's, there's a sort of trade-off or tug of war between needing to be focused in, in, to drive a car or do, mm -hmm. you know, do heart surgery or fly an airplane or whatever <laughs> one does in life and you know, wanting to maintain broad comprehension and mm -hmm. unbounded awareness. and. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, it's something. It's not an either or situation. It's it's something that can exactly. be integrated. So you get both. Yeah, it's actually what already is. So we're just inviting um, the mind just to relax some of the tightness in it, because mm -hmm. that was just born of pressure and you know performance and all that stuff. Yeah, but we do tend to be conditioned by repetitive 
-hmm. experiences, you know, and also by yeah. intense experiences, something comes at oh. you. Let's say you have a fender bender at a certain intersection. Every time you go by that intersection, you like flinch a little bit, like whoa, you know, because it ha <laughs> you have that association. So, yeah. uh, so maybe there's, um, you know, what, what, could you speak to how to unwind the conditioning? Yeah, the the conditioning lately you might notice I'm sort of irreverent, but the conditioning um, has a sort of post-note function, which is it'll maintain history in the body just to remind us that we never want that to happen again. Mm -hmm. So I sort of went around within and found all those sort of like um, contracted post notes and said, okay, I totally agree. We never want that to happen again. And you don't have to hold that in in the field of presence because we're in total accord yeah now there's another one of those things where you're kind of speaking to something in your body mm. you know you're like addressing some tendency well stillness is talking to crystallized stillness mm -hmm. in the form of conditioning so it's the unconditioned talking to the condition going hey do we have to do this <laughs> Could we get a second opinion from the heart? And did that work? And was once oh, yeah. was once enough, or is it some kind of thing you have to kind of wait a minute? You're you're you know looking at the post-it note again. Well, usually if you stay with it more than you know five seconds, it usually gets it because everything is intelligent, and everything actually has a heart. Every you know conditioning is actually devotional. It just got weird. Hmm. It's also physiological. I mean, I've had times when I'm yeah. meditating, for instance, and all of a sudden my body will jump and there'll be this huge release of something, and afterwards I'll just feel like, ah, oh, you know, like, <laughs> like something that was really tight had just dissolved. Yes, yes. And that's what they call spontaneous self-liberation, and that's the body's talent. Because mm -hmm. just as it recorded data it also can just unrecord <laughs> yeah yeah that doesn't need to hold that you know once we're functioning as um informed rooted awareness and then most of that backup mm -hmm. can just rest yeah and gets cleared out i mean you know they talk you've heard you've heard the word <clears throat> most everyone listening has heard the word vasanas which are like these impressions and they're 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 physiological. I mean, both in the physical body and perhaps the subtle body. Yeah. And the unbounded awareness is like a solvent, you know, which loosens them up. And phew. yeah. But we often yeah, experience they, they little flutters as they come out, right? Right. And they don't want to be vasanas. What a drag. Yeah. Do you know? Okay, I get to do this. Another repetitive movement for another thirty-five million years. <laughs> <laughs> 35 million. Now you mentioned uh, Papaji as having mentioned 35 million years, and I was wondering what that meant. Was he saying that our individual existence goes back 35 million years through reincarnations, or what did he mean by that? I don't think he meant just reincarnation, just as human. Yeah, but the, it might you be know this dogs. element, the five elements having come into form and been subject to the laws of um, ooh, the laws of gravity, the laws of the opposites, all sorts of things. But the universe is much older than that, so I was just wondering what he meant. Whether... Yeah, so maybe it was the human tribe. Maybe we're all skulking around. Who knows? Somebody teased him once, and he said, why do you always say 35 million years? Why not 16 million years? And uh -huh. Papaji just gave them such a look. <laughs> like, like, yeah. Keep like, quiet. Lighten up, dude. <laughs> exactly. No yeah. smart ass remarks. <laughs> yeah. In other words, long, I don't know, long time. It sounds great. 35 million, million years. It's such an eternal wow to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, good one. So here's another little teaser for you. The body is not what it appears to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, thank God. Um, 
once again, it's an invitation to look a little deeper. Mm -hmm. um, my joke used to be I used to treat my body as a third world donkey. Mm -hmm. Really, it was more the mind was treating the body like that, hurting it through time and space, pressuring it, you know, if it didn't function well or didn't obey, there would be like mean judging thoughts to harass it into movement. So <clears throat> it's so lovely to look into the field that we call the body, setting aside all the ideas about it. And as we've all noticed in moments of relaxation, it doesn't feel like it has, you know, containment or it's more just a field of stillness, intelligence, responsive, sensitivity and resilience. So it's pretty mysterious. I'm such a lover of looking deeper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and this note, so there, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, so there's also a guided meditation in that one, which is just an invitation to be curious. Yeah, on this body point in your book, it's funny. You say, humans are funny. They love their bodies and treat them badly. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. A um, bunch of chapter titles, but I also had some other little notes that I took as I was going through your book. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll read you some of these because they're, they're things that jumped out at me as being interesting. Um, mm -hmm. If we think there is something to do in order to just be, then it starts all over again. The cycle of unrest. Yeah, so in school we were we were trained very beautifully to be high functioning. And the mind has brought that um, mild to medium to strong pressured intent on the great quest for freedom. So actually the mind contracts to look for something that's relaxed and open. So it's just, you know, once again, we get back to just honoring all these um, innocent misunderstandings so that they can relax, open, and then notice what is. And on, on the theme of rest and relaxation, um, this is a quote from Honey the Dog. Give yourself lots of space to rest. And there's a picture in the book of honey sleeping. The secret to my boundless energy and enjoyment is I know how to rest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so rest is an absence of movement. One can um, be in high functioning during the day or mm -hmm. on a long hike and, and still have that felt sense of rest. Because rest within the word is um, the Latin beingness already our true nature is already at rest i'm looking out the window at the trees uh -huh. they're experts they're at rest mm -hmm. yeah i guess we could say rest is the basis of activity lovely yeah and it animates all activity yeah, yeah. and it's interesting to notice that um a lot of the sages and, and saints and so on um who undoubtedly were in a very natural rested state subjectively and I bet even physiologically if you hooked them up you'd find that there wasn't a lot of extraneous inefficiency in the way their bodies were, were working they have boundless energy you know they can go and go and go and go and apparently not get tired <laughs> I love that I'm, I'm happy to get some extra transmission for that I'm sure that my friends would say that about me but sometimes the felt sense is more like clunk <laughs> yeah that too i mean you know we have our limitations but um yeah you know they, they I've, I've read studies about this where um a, a kind of a, a body that's full of all sorts of pent-up stress and impressions and so on mm -hmm. just operates very inefficiently it, it's it's kind of like a car that has all kinds of rust and stuff in the motor it has to really yeah. work hard to, to get yeah. anywhere whereas a really nicely finely tuned engine it, it burn it has better fuel mileage and it just you know runs more smoothly and all yeah yeah so so just you know that's another 
lovely thing about um, inviting the unconditioned to liberate the conditioning because it, it eats up a lot of the, the ROM of the biocomputer. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> just to maintain a contraction in a field of deep relaxation requires a little extra juice. So. Yeah. Um, and again, the word naturalness, we're kind of throwing that around a little bit here. Um, I think maybe you would say that naturalness and I think what you're alluding to here is um, learning to function in a state of naturalness, which is what your whole book is about, really. I mean, dogs are natural. They, they, they're not neurotic, most of them. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they can be I, I mean, saying they can be. Yeah, they can be really neurotic. But a, 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 a dog that hasn't been neuroticized by its owners <laughs> tends to be just very natural. And that's why we love them, you know? There's, a, yeah. there's an innocence. That's it. And a natural joy. They're like following their feet and their nose and, you know, their whole body is, is moving, following its interest. I love it. Yeah. I think that's why children are so charming and saints and sages. I mean, they, they sometimes are just so charismatic, you know, just so you can sit and watch them mm -hmm. for hours, just their facial expressions, mm -hmm. just because of mm -hmm. a certain naturalness that you don't ordinarily find. Freedom. That's it. Yeah. You know, because life, that's the arc of life. And it's not just an arc. It's probably two arcs that make a circle mm -hmm. where life just, you know, it can apparently en encumber itself. And then its great delight is to unencumber itself. Mm. So it's a great journey. One thing I like a lot about what you say, and I think it was in your introduction that I read also, um, is your appreciation of the intelligence of life. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I'll just let you talk about that a little bit rather than asking a big long question. Yeah, that was um, <clears throat> the first time I noticed that, it probably wasn't the first time, but it was with my dog Honey, mm -hmm. and we were on a mountain uh, trail that was very narrow, mm -hmm. and we were above a cliff. And I'm, you know, really noticing where my feet are mm -hmm. and being naturally cautious in a healthy way. And she is just galloping down this path. Mm -hmm. And my body contracted out of worried love. And I'm going, oh, no, my dog, you know. <laughs> and then I noticed that every part of her being and body was intelligent. Mm -hmm. That was the first... <gasps> Like her, her paws were intelligent. Ever, all the muscles, it, you know, her eyes, her balance, everything. It was completely the movement of relaxed intelligence just galloping down this path. Mm. And it allowed the worried love in me to relax. And then I started noticing, wow, everything is intelligent. Yeah, not just the, animate things, not just yeah, biological the, life, but... I know, yeah. the road I'm driving on is intelligent, it's been engineered to have these curves, you know, the car is intelligent, my glasses are, my body is. Yeah. That was very relaxing. Yeah, I mean, people will tire of hearing me say this because I've said it many times, but... Um, if we think about what science has told us about the way th things are working, I mean, a single grain of salt has like a billion, billion atoms in it. And every single one of those little atoms is a marvel that we don't fully understand. And, but somehow it's humming away, you know, and uh, along with its billion, billion brothers and sisters and, you know, in a single grain of salt. And, and, wow. it just, and it goes out from there to the whole universe where you'll never find a spot that isn't like that with, with this, yes. all this amazing, intelligent complexity in it. So yeah. it, it boggles the mind, you know, it's awe-inspiring. Yeah, I think that's the great invitation from life if we slow down enough just for a moment, not forever, to notice that life is just always saying, hey, you know, A, you are me, and B, I have your back, Yeah. and I'm always carrying you, and I'm looking out of your eyes, mm. and every cell of your body is humming away, doing its thing. And when, that was another fun noticing many moons ago, is that I'm not doing anything. Mm. I'm not breathing, I'm not digesting, I'm not thinking, I'm not, you know, I'm basically just... Mm, along for the ride. Life is doing everything. 
Yeah. Let's talk about that a little bit. I wanted to talk to you about this. Um, you know, obviously there are certain functions, I, I guess they call them autonomic or something, that, are, mm -hmm. uh, that happen without our even knowing it. The way our liver is working, the way our heart is beating, mm -hmm. the way our stomach is digesting. And if we had to actually run all that stuff consciously, we'd die immediately. <laughs> you know? Yeah, the, in one day we would fall over. And in go, one okay, second we would much. fall over, you know, if we had to, had to run that stuff, like keep your heart beating, oh, beat, beat, wait, my, my liver, I forgot my liver. Um, <laughs> um, but, then, but then there, and sometimes people use that as an example of how everything is running on automatic, but then there are all the other things that we do seem to have a choice over, at least most people do seem to. You know, I can raise my arm or not raise my arm. I can throw a baseball. I can cook lunch. I, you know, there's all this sort of willful, conscious, intentional stuff. Yeah, but the cool oh, thing Irene, is... Irene mentioned is... I can't cook lunch. She's right about that. That's <laughs> <laughs> good to have discernment in the background. Grilled cheese sandwiches, um, maybe. <laughs> well, as far as I can tell, the impulse to play baseball or the impulse to go for a walk or arises from stillness, mm -hmm. presents itself to its own embodiment or awareness, and then there is a yay or a nay, there's resonance or not, and then off you go to play baseball or not. So even that, even that impulse and that apparent willfulness is, is not ours. It's like a menu inside, how about this? Yeah. I remember hearing Timothy, not Timothy, um, I'm about to mention him in a second. I remember hearing um, Sargadatta say that, um, you know, f he was speaking to his audience and he was saying, you know, for you, things like digestion and heartbeat and stuff, breathing are automatic. He said, for me, everything is that way. This whole issue of free will versus spontan spontaneous nature running the show, you know, and... Um, you know, from the outside, it looks like, okay, well, this guy has a compulsion to smoke cigarettes. There's an individual desire for those, and yet he has all this wonderful wisdom. And at a certain point, he decided to stop smoking them. And Timothy Conway said they, they cleared a path in the Jarshan Hall, Then he would pace up and down between all the people, up and down that path, because he was so rest, restlessness from the nicotine withdrawal. And yeah. um, so I'm just sort of wondering about, I mean, people say there's no sense of personal self, for instance, that's fallen away. And, um, but it, I, I don't, I'm not quite there in terms of my... No, it's, it's more that the body was restless because mm -hmm. it wasn't getting its... Um, nicotine. Uh, nicotine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, that's why for me it's, it's very um, practical to include the body because, you know, the body has habits mm -hmm. and it has habits of how it um, sedated itself in the past. And... Um, True nature, this naturalness that we are, you know, will start to notice, wow, there's some habit or a contraction or a, something that doesn't serve, that's no longer required. Mm. Yeah. But, um, I mean, in your, I heard one interview in which you were talking about the, the sense of Pamela having fallen away or the sense of personal self. Um, do you mean that sort of? absolutely ultimately thoroughly or is there did it more like take a back seat and there is still some sense of personal self but it it really is nowhere near as predominant as it used to be hmm see i speak about it differently so the apparent role of pamela mm -hmm. fell away and it was very abrupt in a beautiful satsang with neelam mm -hmm. and then um <clears throat> ah <laughs> Then pure being was just enjoying itself. It wasn't terribly informed or rooted yet, but mm -hmm. it was uh, a delight. I would say that uh, the persona falls away. The essence of the persona is um, uniqueness. So the uniqueness and the genuine interests remain. Mm -hmm. I think the reference to the restlessness of Nizagadatta having quit smoking is a reference to his body, mm -hmm. not him. It was his body that smoked and somehow true nature was enjoying until it wasn't. Yeah. So it decided to quit. Yeah. Um, but, um, so you're saying there's a uniqueness and a, a 
th that's Pamela, uh, s some kind of individual expression that <coughs> is unique, unique to you, unique to me, and so on? I would say it's actually not, um, I would say it's the uniqueness of life. Pretty much anything life comes into form mm -hmm. is a unique expression. Yeah. So, um, you know, because if I track backwards when I was young, I would notice awareness being drawn. Of course, I didn't have the words for it. It was just I could have been crawling on the floor and it, awareness was moving the body towards something that intrigued it. So same, that's actually always what's happened. We're just following um, resonance and interest. Unfortunately, for most of us, the mind was uh, co-opted that and then started to script and direct and mm -hmm. insist. Mm. Mm. Well, let me just persist a little bit more at the risk of okay. being, being a pest. But, um, you know, like if I see you at the SAND conference and I say, hey, Pamela, you know, you, you'll turn around and, and say hi. Uh, and somehow or other, you know, you re realized there's a, there was some individuation that realized I wasn't calling somebody else, I was calling you. Uh, or if you, you know, stub your toe, it's like there, there's some kind of localized recognition of pain, yeah. which is not, you know, the tree outside isn't feeling it, Pamela, the, 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 the thing we, I, we look at and call Pamela <laughs> seems to be feeling it. So I, I'm And I'm happy for that, thank God. That's yeah, still it's a, we'd probably kill ourselves if we didn't have that. <laughs> Um, so no, I'm just kind of getting at um, whether there can really be a complete obliteration of all sense of personal self or whether it really can be, it just diminishes and we, ha we pr identify more primarily with something more universal. Hmm. I think, you know, the impersonal is animating the personal. Yeah. Just as it's animating everything. And as far as I can tell, it edits what it no longer needs. So consciousness clarifies its own instrument because it's no longer its genuine interest to do role play or feel separate or whatever it was playing before. Now its genuine interest is um, hmm, what Robert Adams said, pervading everything, rooting everything clarifying everything, returning back for anything that's suffering. So mm, that's how I see it. Okay, I think that makes sense. So in other words, consciousness is calling the shots. And, uh, oh yeah, it's doing everything. <laughs> yeah, and, and I like that phrase you said, it's, I forget exactly how I said, it's purifying or it's refining its own instrument. It's, it's, yeah. it's continuing to evolve the instrument through which it can enjoy as a living it can enjoy life as a living reality rather than just some abstract yeah. absolute thing yeah okay. and we actually all have that experience it's not about awake asleep oddly enough it's based on how relaxed the embodiment is mm -hmm. so in those moments if we've you know have our feet in the warm sand on the beach and you're gazing at an ocean and nothing is required of you the entire body relaxes and opens and the mind relaxes and opens and oh there's just true nature so what we talk about and probably in all the interviews is just about a relaxed field of presence yeah and it doesn't matter if it comes home through golfing or long distance running or the, I call it the grace of exhaustion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think that's one of those in if perhaps the most fundamental innate human drive is for that to return back to that restful, relaxed, natural state, you know? Yeah. And there are all kinds of things which delude people into thinking that they might provide it such as you know opioids which are now epidemic mm -hmm. and various things mm -hmm. like that which kind of cheat you you know they don't really do it yeah yeah they sedate the body temporarily but they don't liberate anything yeah yeah 
Here's an interesting quote from your book uh, related to this. You say, what agitates the mind is not circumstances, but being contained. The mind is vast, and it is in too small a space. Your head. Your head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's like, you know, you see those animals at the zoo, they're in a cage, and they're just all sort of pacing and restless because they're, they're constricted, they're contained. Yeah. They don't, it's not natural. They say that a, a tiger can wear a sort of channel into the cement of his cage a foot deep. Wow, just pacing. In the cement, just from pacing. As, and that's true for all of us. I mean, life is has such a high vibratory rate, and we see it in kids. I mean, they can't stop dancing or moving or exploring or running or jumping. Mm -hmm. And then it, 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 as we get older, it gets contained. And that's where the frustration comes. It's not so much with circumstance, because when we're relaxed, sometimes, okay, I don't really like that circumstance, but it's not such a big deal. But when the body is like, mm, there's no room, yeah. Yeah, there's something so, in the Upanishads or someplace that says there's, there's no joy in smallness. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, I, I don't know if that's precisely the way it's expressed, but that's the idea that, you know, we're, we're meant to be unbounded and anything which constricts us is we're not going yes. to be happy with it yeah so when we were teenagers maybe we were unbounded without discernment yeah but we, now we might we have are... needed a little constraint <laughs> <laughs> but now we can be unbounded because we're street smart and we have discernment yeah mm -hmm. um there was in one of your interviews, I think it was Lucia, you were talking about the number of neurons in the heart and, and, and the gut as well as the brain. And I got curious and looked that up. Um, there are about 100 billion in the brain, about 100 million in the gut, and at least 40,000 around the, the heart. Um, and I quoted, a th I wrote, typed out a thing here, printed out a thing. It says, it turns out that butterflies and that sinking feeling in the stomach have a neurological basis. Neurons lining the stomach are filled with neurotransmitters, chemicals that help nerve cells communicate with one another. One key neurotransmitter is serotonin, which plays a major role in mood regulation. While serotonin is also found in the brain, 95% of the body's supply is in the stomach. This yes. Ab yeah. This abundance <laughs> explains why drugs like Prozac, um, known as SSRIs, help elevate mood by increasing serotonin levels, but also cause stomach disturbances. Oh. But that was interesting. <clears throat> yeah, and I think the newest research is that there's actually more neurons in the heart. More but, than the 40,000. Yeah, 40,000 yeah. doesn't seem like very many. Yeah. So we'll see. We all have listened to that, you know, gut intuition. And at least in my case, I overrode it regularly. I used to tell the still small voice, hey, you better speak up because I'm not listening. <laughs> so now I'm now I'm listening. Now you listen. Good. Yeah. Huh. Um, okay. There's something you talked about in uh, one of your interviews. You, you got into this thing of talking about um, the elementals and gods and mm -hmm. how they thrive on devotion. And mm -hmm. that was kind of interesting. It was... Um, you know, you're talking basically about subtle realms and the beings who reside mm -hmm. there. I mean, is that just, was that just sort of a little sidelight or is that something that actually interests you and do you think that's significant? Mm. Well, now when I think of elemental beingness, I think of um, one of the ways to speak of it is the five elements. Mm -hmm. So we have earth and water and fire and air. And space. But the, and space. But see, it's the space element. Robert Adams called it spaceless space. So to me, it is the one that is holding all the other elements and of course, all of existence and non-existence and whatever you want to call mm -hmm. it. So to me, um, when I feel into what resonates for me as a word, it's elemental beingness mm -hmm. or, or I'm this warm, warm space, spaceless space. So to me, that's what I talk about when I speak of elemental beingness. Okay. Not so much gods and um, 
mischievous, mischievous nature spirits, but the mm, the building blocks of life itself. Mm. Which, according to some teachings, are intelligence. They're impulses of intelligence. They're not just oh, no, they're, they're, they're not just laws of physics or something. They're they're actually. In, I, I, I'm they not, have a supreme intelligence. Yeah. Here. And obviously they have names for them, like, you know, when they you talk about the Hindus and they have a name for the god of fire and the god of air, mm -hmm. Vayu, and so on. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they're, they're actually pointing to intelligence conducting these various phenomena in nature. Yeah, and it's animating everything very benevolently and without any effort. Mm. I mean, I, I'm just struck by formless, the formlessness that's holding all the planets up. Mm -hmm. It's not efforting. It's not like scrunching its shoulders like Atlas. It's just uh, totally relaxed. <laughs> yeah. It's mm. taking the path of least action. There you go. Yeah. If I mean, if you're the supreme, you're the omnipotence of the universe, absolute strength, then, then you can be absolutely relaxed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like if you throw a tennis ball, there are a million different paths it could take, but it actually takes the most efficient path. It takes the the path uh -huh. of absolute least action, and you know the, Ooh, the parabola know it follows is you know you can calculate that in terms of its being the i the most uh, efficient parabola that could it could possibly take. I'm sure my dog knew that. Oh yeah, that's how he catches them. That's right, because it's the same intelligence. Yeah, she just says this little algebra thing in her head and runs over there and boom, get. <laughs> Oh, lovely. <laughs> mm. Here's a phrase I like from the book. Um, the divine often moves at the speed of molasses. Yeah, no rush, no time or space. Yeah, and it also, I mean, we look at our dogs, if there's a rabbit or a squirrel, wow, that's yeah, impressive. They move pretty fast. Yeah, I once saw a stag in the forest go from absolute alert stillness mm -hmm. to a bound that I couldn't quite figure out how far away it was but it was almost like there was just a little contraction like it had springs mm. in its legs it went from stillness to a breathtaking bound in a heartbeat and there was no thought it was just boing yeah so that's our friend life it's gorgeous yeah, you mentioned the word benevolence a minute ago, and um, you know some people wouldn't regard. Well, some people don't regard the orchestration of the universe as having any intelligence to it. They think it's mechanistic. In fact, that's the predominant scientific paradigm. <laughs> um, and, that's uh, very rude. <laughs> yeah. But in spiritual circles, we tend to say, well, it's benevolence. There's a kind of an evolutionary purpose to thing, things, a, a kind of a cosmic motivation or intention and so on. But then a lot of people have a hard time reconciling that with things that we see happening in the world, um, both on individual levels and societal levels. So, and that, that kind of ties in with the, the phrase, the divine often moves at the speed of molasses. I mean, do you have a kind of a sense that there is a um, an evolutionary traje trajectory and that there's the whole thing is sort of, although it may seem unkind at times, there's there's mm -hmm. a, a benign or beneficial um, evolutionary purpose to the course of events? Hmm. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'd have to speak of it the way that resonates for me. Um, if we set aside the human tribe for a second, because mm -hmm. there's a noticing of benevolence and malevolence. Um, but just in nature, if we think of nature, nature can be as extreme and giving and gorgeous and frightening because everything is eternal. Mm. Um, there is no death. So, so that's why a lot of sages invite folks to sit with the illusion of death. And mm -hmm. for one's friends that have sat with loved ones, like I 
got to sit with my grandfather as he passed. It's very convincing death. And yet we want to look at what dies. So even as, you know, a volcano can explode or a, a village can get covered by the, the lava, even though it appears that beloveds lost their lives, you know, this that we are is eternal. It's not subject to birth or death or existence or non-existence. So that to me is why I can say life is benevolent. Yeah. It is, its original gift was eternal life, which is why it can play hard and be extreme and thunder and lightning and also soft summer days. Mm. Yeah. Water cannot wet it, fire cannot burn it, weapons cannot cleave it, and all that. Yeah, that's it. Those Death vices. cannot touch it. Yeah. Yeah. And we're not, I think we're not, at least I would say, we're not just talking about death cannot touch the absolute pure consciousness, but it, there's something, there's that essence we were talking about earlier, there's something indestructible about that, too. Yeah. Uh, and not, yeah. not just the absolute essence, but the essence of Pamela, the essence of Rick, something which, if this body dies, gets carried on and the, the path yeah. continues. Yeah, and, and to me, the, the way I was curious about that, because like my dogs, I have a dogged curiosity, <laughs> is I was looking into, you know, the individuality of myself and other friends, and when that word fell away, I noticed that what I appreciate in my friends and in nature and everything is the uniqueness. Mm. And of course, we all also love the sameness, the oneness, because mm. it's just mm. sublime. And then when I was looking into the nature of uniqueness, all of a sudden I saw, oh, so oneness is animating uniqueness. Mm -hmm. And then I was curious, is does uniqueness fall away when you die? So persona and belief systems and all that sort of thing do because the mind is resting. But natural interests and resonance, I think they're eternal because they're life's pleasure. Now I've had a <clears throat> little Dharma debate with a very strict Hindu Swami, and he goes, if you think that, you are confused. But what does he I, say? I like, he, well, he thought I was confused. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what does he think? It was different than that. Oh, you know, I think it was more he wanted to celebrate the absence of the persona. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I agree with him because the persona is role play. So it's after a while, it's like a shredded garment and it's such a blessing when it relaxes but, but hindus genuine... are all into reincarnation i mean that's like second nature for them oh yeah 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 but we didn't even touch that because you know that's one of the taboo subjects in advaita yeah. <laughs> but it was more like you know it's life's own pleasure mm -hmm. it's life's own pleasure you know it's its interest. So I don't think that subsides. Yeah. And I don't think it should be a taboo subject in, in Advaita. I mean, the Sar um, I don't know about the Sargadatta, but um, I think he actually, at one point in his teaching, said it didn't work that way, and another point he said it did. Ramana certainly referred <laughs> to it, you know. Uh, yeah. My, my cow no, was the reincarnation of so and so. And yeah. When Robert went to sit with Ramana, Ramana confirmed they had known each other the earlier round yeah. of, or life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you read uh, or listen to David Godman's stories about the things Ramana said and, and Papaji, yeah. for that matter, they're, they're all talking yeah. about this stuff. I don't yeah. know. It's like... No, it's I, really, if we call it eternal life, nobody can quibble. Yeah. But, you know, the, the human mind, it likes to quibble. <clears throat> I was interviewing a, a Buddhist fellow last week who was very charming, but we had this quibble a little bit between us about this topic. But somehow I think th these kinds of understandings really shape one's worldview, and they are significant. I mean, you can think whatever you want, but um, I kind of like to know how things actually work. 
And I don't Me think, too. yeah, I don't think the universe rearranges itself f according to our whims. It's it's really, you know, incumbent upon us to figure out how it works, not for the universe to jump around and say, oh, you think you think the Earth is flat? Okay, boom, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank heavens. Thank heavens. Yeah, yeah. no, it, it's to me, it's just um, often the the quibble is about the words, not the essence of what the conversation is about and no one everyone in their heart knows they are eternal and that's why people are surprised when they hear they're dying uh -huh. what? <laughs> but I'm eternal how can I be dying anyhow I think they may know that in their heart of hearts but I think yeah. a lot of people that that knowing is very much occluded by doubts and and misunderstandings yeah. and you know some people really feel like when this body dies that's it lights out yeah I don't know about which that. is scary I mean you know if I know people who have thought that way and they're kind of scared of yeah either that or they're looking forward to it because they feel like that's it I, you know I'm out of here and, and I won't have to suffer anymore there'll be no <laughs> like a no eternal time out <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh my yeah mm. it, here's a good line from your book while we dogs rely on lots of awareness and some barking, humans rely on lots of barking and some awareness. Yeah. Yeah, I have a lot of compassion for the, for humanity. And just because we didn't get any of the defenses animals got, we didn't get the size of the elephant, we didn't get the claws of the tiger or the night vision, mm -hmm. we didn't get any of the camouflage. So you're sort of like this soft little instrument that uh, you know if something dangerous happens what you can maybe jump up and down or mm. run away but that's about it so all the, that barking that's the defenses mm. so I like honoring them because they've been on duty forever honoring the barking the, def the, the defenses. defenses right yeah yeah because their essence is pure strength, so I don't want them to go away. I want them to root down and be unshakable strength, mm -hmm. rather than lots of agitated, reactive barking. That's an interesting uh, point, because some people talk about vulnerability, just being open, and you know, letting it all wash through you. And I think that that has to go hand in hand with the establishment of strength um yes in, invincible strength because otherwise you you can just get kind of you know ripped to shreds by stuff if you haven't f established a foundation mm -hmm. yeah. yeah and it, everybody has that you know because we overlook our resilience and only notice the sensitivity but if you really feel into behind sensitivity or the shakeability there is this unshakable, resilient mountain strength. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's there, um, mm -hmm. but it, you know it has to be has to be cultured. I mean, it has to. It's there. It's like water in a well. It's there, but you have to kind of send down the bucket and you know make it. <laughs> <laughs> Say hello, hello. I yeah. need you. <laughs> mm. Because yeah, we have to think of people who, you know, it, it's a. It, doesn't help them to say, you know, you've got this great strength because they feel very vulnerable, they feel very weak, yes. and and somehow that they have to tap into that strength and integrate it mm -hmm. into their experience in order for it to be yeah. a practical consideration. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at the soldier who goes to Iraq and he's big and strong and and uh, you know ready to fight, and he comes back, you know, basket case with PTSD. Uh, mm. the, the nervous system, the mind have been so assaulted by yes, the intensity yes. of the experience that the inner oh. strength has been has been totally lost and it needs to be rediscovered. Yeah, and that's the gift of um, nature. There's a beautiful story or even so many of the new trauma work that's out, but there is a story of elephants that um, had been in a circus mm. and some innocent billionaire decided to liberate them back to Africa Ooh. and um, they weren't mm -hmm. ready well you know he, he had them flown over mm -hmm. I think there were three of them there's a, a mother and then two 
younger ones and um, they were in a holding area for a little bit just to recover from jet lag, <laughs> get the lay of the land. And then the first thing she did, the big um, Mother. female elephant, is she took them into the woods. Mm -hmm. So they basically went on a forest retreat for two years to recover from being around humans, mm. stressed humans. And um, then at the end of two years, she came back down with her two friends and literally said thank you and then went back to the forest. Uh -huh. So it's so beautiful. That's what we do need. We need these natural retreats for some of us. It might be just a quiet weekend at home or going for a walk in the woods or just being with our dog. Or mm. We do need those natural retreats. They're healthy. Yeah. And there can be cycles of retreats too, like yes. little daily retreats. Half an yeah. hour, half an hour here, and half an hour there, or mm -hmm. weekend retreats and week-long retreats, and you know, yeah. whatever we can arrange. Yeah. Well, even going to bed at night—that's a sort of retreat. And, oh, it is deep sleep, yeah. yummy. <laughs> um, <coughs> here's a nice little phrase from the book. And incidentally, those listening—we uh, got about 170 people listening. Um, if you feel like asking a question, go to the upcoming interviews page on batgap.com and scroll down to the bottom. There's a form. Mm -hmm. um, so here's a nice little phrase. I, I just clipped little bits from the book that I kind of I like that jumped out at me that I Thank thought would you. be a nice little stimuli for conversation. But everyone blooms with respectful, spacious attention and contracts with disapproval, disinterest, and disrespect. Mm -hmm. These are all things that you're quoting your dog as saying, or that yeah. the dog is saying. And then the <laughs> dog says, don't diss the divine. Mm. So all beings are divine. Robert Adams used to start his satsangs with, you are not who you appear to be, you are divine. And the first time I heard that, my whole body relaxed. Mm. So, yeah, we're all the same, really. Animals, humans, nature. We like feeling honored and respected and seen or listened to and mm. we bloom that way and then we've all remembered those moments where we've encountered disrespect or harshness and there's an instant contraction in our body and in the heart and because it's unnatural. It's unnatural. Yeah, I'm sure we can think of examples of the way mm. children are treated, you know, mm -hmm. um, for good or bad, and mm. you know, scenes in grocery stores and so on where children are treated yeah. one way or another way, and the reaction it gets from the children. But yeah. um, you know, mm -hmm. I think there's a saying that you, you attract more flies with honey than with vinegar or something. It's like <laughs> <laughs> sweet, sweetness and love and and so on have. <laughs> better effect. Well, it's just genuine respect. It's no different than it's, it's nothing over the top. It's like uh, walking down the street and seeing a stranger and just like a little nod, nod of the head. I see you. Mm -hmm. Hello. It's, it's, I think part of the human tribe because of the separation app, which is a protective app, <clears throat> you know, a lot of the human tribe is so cut off from healthy community and you know natural respect and that that's one of the irritants mm. yeah so it's a nice sentiment i guess that it always comes back to the question of well how is there a, there seems to be a paucity of love in the world you know is that song what the world needs now is love sweet love that's the only thing that there's just too little of um, and we all know, kind of know intuitively and philosophically that there that God is love and there's a vast reservoir of love <clears throat> uh, and uh, it's a question of why why is there such a drought you know and how, how can we what what mm. how can we maximize our contribution to uh, eliminating the drought mm. I would say that probably in maybe half or of humanity love is under house arrest mm. meaning the love is there but the defense is no, it's a treasure and have contracted around it. Mm. And then the mind 
is saying things and wanting to push so-called others away to keep that love safe. So it, it's kind of, you know, we do need a little, ah, oh, some ray of sunlight somehow to break that um, habit. And it's Cycle. not breaking it, it's softening it. Mm. And uh, a lot of sages, I met a sage in India, and he said that's all he did all day was, when he wasn't in satsang, was pray for humanity. Mm -hmm. So he was in that prayer, honoring the innocent naturalness, the healthiness of humanity. Mm so that it would rise up and because when that naturalness um, is fed somehow through music or art or dance or golfing or following what it loves it starts to open and as it opens its vibratory rate starts to um, liberate the conditioning and the defenses and the contractions so mm. Yeah, I saw this story on the news the other night about these kids in some inner city school and somebody had funded the, a music program. You know, there's so much attempt these days to cut music and art and things like that out of school curricula. And, uh, but somebody had funded this music program and all the kids were learning how to drum and play clarinets and all this mm -hmm. stuff. And, and it just had a, a huge effect on their behavior, um, you yeah. know, truancy and, and behavioral problems and even academics. It, it was, you know, really mm -hmm. enriching. So I, I mentioned that because that's, you know, music is kind of yeah. a language of the heart. And it, it, it's so important. Yeah, it's like there are certain factions that feel like all we need is mind education. We don't need heart education. Yikes. <laughs> uh. No, thank you to that. Speaking of love, in the chapter on love, you say in the book, we noticed um, the heart is omnipresent and permeates and soothes all realms of existence. It is mm -hmm. compassion and holds all beings. It is the mystic. Mm -hmm. So that's within everyone's heart, no matter what role they've played. Yeah. So it's, it's there. It's the great treasure, of course, so it will be defended. Mm. So one of the great fast ways to liberate the heart is to notice if there's any um, tension in front of it or around it or behind it. And to go inside and just a little respect to the protection, the tightness, because the defenses, um, they actually relax with respect rather than you know, with the wisdom teachings. Mm -hmm. And then we can look at what is of such great value in the chest area that it's under house arrest or mm. protected. And then the more you honor that, and it can be in your absolutely own unique way, then it starts to uncontain itself and notice its vastness. Because if the heart feels and it's the mind's view of the heart that it's a small fragile instrument then it'll stay small and protected but when we honor it it starts to stretch out and um, open and can even root and then we're going yes that's the gift we can give humanity because then it it actually touches all hearts everywhere and invites the heart to say, hey, you're huge. You don't have to play small. Mm -hmm. So I have a question about um, whether defensiveness is ever um, really desirable. Um, you know, it's like in taking examples from nature. So many different animals have protective shells, for instance, and they would die without them. Um, so, you know, perhaps if, if all of us have built up protective shells around our hearts to some extent, maybe that's the way it was meant to be and and you know it doesn't mean we have to be encased in them forever but maybe they're there for a purpose and and there's a certain art of, mm -hmm. to um being freed from them 
perhaps it's, it requires, we wouldn't want to be freed instantly. That could be catastrophic, but there's a, <laughs> <laughs> we want to sort or of. Or not. <laughs> yeah, maybe or not, or, but maybe there's some art to dismantling them um, as quickly as possible. What do you think? Well, I, I love what you're saying because you're basically honoring, inviting us to notice that a healthy, natural caution mm -hmm. is wise. It's wise. It's discerning. Yeah, I think life protects itself <clears throat> until it knows its big strength mm -hmm. and then st until the discernment is really unveiled. And then the defenses can fall away. Mm. And then there's just a healthy, natural caution that remains. And that's part of discernment. Mm -hmm. And it's part of understanding, you know, the body and life. And Yeah. So if I could summarize a point out of that, it might be, um, don't be so concerned about removing the defenses. Be more concerned about increasing the strength. And there you go. Yeah, and as the strength increases, the defenses will naturally fall away, kind of like, you know, shake a snake shedding its skin or something. Yes, exactly. They're just there until we know our rooted strength. I yeah. love that you confirm that. Yeah, the snake wouldn't want to lose its skin until it's ready to shed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good point. Yeah. Naked. Yikes. Yikes. Oh. Um, let's, uh, you know, I've often been asked and have often wondered, there, there seems to be a lot of spiritual teachers whom I respect a lot and who, who really go through some health stuff. Um, you know, Adya has his, his issues with, you know, Bell's palsy and various things and various other people. Neelam has her issues with chemical sensitivity and EF, EMF rays and all that stuff. Um, what do you think about the whole thing of waking up to whatever degree of enlightenment we have woken up to and having to deal with all kinds of health issues as a consequence. Mm. Mm. Well, it would be unique for everyone, but we don't want to turn it into a belief. It does seem to be a syndrome or a tendency or pattern. But it's, it's not true. I mean, bodies are sensitive and they're resilient. And I don't think it has anything to do with wakefulness or lack of wakefulness. Or... Mm. So you don't, you don't think that awakened people are a little bit more inclined to um, have that kind of thing going on, like their their body is really channeling a lot of voltage and, and, it, and it takes its toll, anything like that? No, I think that's a belief. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so I, I was saying I don't think it was any accident that the throat started tickling and the body started coughing when we were talking about defenses because the mm -hmm. body was confirming I have natural defenses mm -hmm. and they're natural. So the human extra conditioning of worry and tension and replaying and reviewing and all that stuff, that's just backup. And it's not needed as soon as we return to that, you know, clear seeing and mm. street smarts. Yeah. <clears throat> so, I guess you could say when the battle's over, you can take off your armor. Nicely said. Yeah, it's awfully heavy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Clanky and heavy and hot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, here's a nice little section. This will give your voice a rest. I'll, I'll read this and it'll take me a minute. It's, it's <laughs> uh, Honey's Detecting Pointers on Divine Qualities. Honey, again, for those watching, is... Pamela's dog. <clears throat> Sorrow, when uncontained, is compassion. Desire, when uncontained, is satisfaction. And interrupt me, Pamela, if you want to comment on any of these. Anger, when liberated, is big strength. Fatigue, when dived into, is deep peace. Judgment, when honored, is discernment. Unworthiness, when met, is humility. Fear, when soothed, is natural courage. Mm. Frustration is the invitation to return to the unlimited pride. No, to the unlimited, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> the unlimited pride. <laughs> pride, when met, is dignity. Seriousness is your gravitas, 
naivete unveils itself as innocence, which unveils itself as majesty. Not knowing, even confusion, when met, reveals itself as wisdom in its potentiality. Pure intelligence. Ah, uh, it's such a relief, you know, because for so many of us, we thought there was something wrong with us, that we had all those, you know, uncomfortable feelings inside. Mm -hmm. And just to realize they're actually natural or divine qualities that under pressure go to their opposite. Mm. So uh, a lovely young Indian woman came to satsang in London <clears throat> a few months back. And she told me, because, oh, you're, you're expressing the Anjali Mudra. Mm -hmm. And I'd never heard of that. And I said, what's the Anjali Mudra? She says, it's where you consciously bring the opposites together. Mm -hmm. So they balance each other and can rest in stillness. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it was something that Innocence here just discovered within. And how beautiful that it's celebrated in India. It's a thing. Yeah. yeah. Confirmation. Yay. That's great. <clears throat> um, I'll read a few more little passages from your thing, and, and if you want to comment, you can, and, and then uh, I'll, we'll wrap it up. I want to, I'm concerned about your voice. Um, <laughs> it's okay. Here's a nice one. The Golden Retriever motto is, bow first and ask questions later. Nothing is what it appears to be. It may be the divine in disguise. Hmm. There's some cool stories in the Vedic literature about the divine in the, in the disguise of dogs. Uh, you might have read some of them. There's one where Yudhishthira, who was one of the five Pandava brothers, Arjuna being the most famous one, was at the end of the Mahabharata. He was climbing this mountain, and symbolically he was going to go into heaven by climbing this mountain. And the other brothers had already died, and he, it was just him, and some dog started following him. And so he was walking along with this dog, and they're climbing the mountain, and they finally get to the top, and I guess it's like the gates of heaven, and Saint, the the Hindu equivalent of Saint Peter, <laughs> whoever that might be, uh, says, "Hey, I'm sorry, you can't bring that dog in here." And um, so Yudhishthira said, "Well, I'm sorry then, I'm not going to come in. You know, I, he, the dog has taken refuge in me, and I would never uh, abandon anyone or anything that's taken refuge in me. So I'll I'll go elsewhere. So thank you." And at that point, the dog kind of, I think it revealed itself as Lord Shiva or something, who had yeah. taken the guise of a dog to test Yudhishthira to see if he was really worthy of entering heaven. And to test the gatekeeper. Yeah. Oh, my. <laughs> and th there's I'm another story like hear. that with Shankara, where he was on some road and some dog showed up, and, and Shankara treated the dog rudely or something, and, and then it turned out it was Lord Shiva in disguise <laughs> testing Shankara. <laughs> so watch what yeah. you do with dogs. Yeah, and, that's right. And cats and worms and yeah, all beings. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. We all love to be honored and respected, and we're not fond of disrespect. Mm. Mm. Okay, I'm going to read a final little passage here, which is almost like a little prayer or something, and uh, and then we can wrap it up. Um, this is from again from from the book that your dog wrote. Um, May you, may you know you are precious. May you know your essential innocence is ever pure. May you notice you are not the sum of your past, but a mystery ever new and always supported, held and loved. Know that death cannot touch you as you are indestructible spirit. Mm. So that's nice. Yeah, that is life's confirmation mm -hmm. <clears throat> that everything it creates has absolute value. Yeah, mm -hmm. nice. The world is my family. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, it's a beautiful sentiment, and, and uh, I hope, hopefully, as we go along, that it will become more and more universally appreciated, because, uh, you know, what a world we would have if everyone recognized that everything, yeah. everything has absolute value. Yeah. Well, I'm trusting that <clears throat> in this noticing that we've all shared that things often will flare up mm -hmm. within before they rest and root, that that's also true in what we're perceiving outside in all these flare-ups. Hopefully they're flaring up to return back to balance 
and natural, healthy, loving kindness. Yeah. Um, Charles Eisenstein said that a couple weeks ago when I interviewed him. He's written a book about sacred economics and another book called the the something like the beautiful world our hearts know is possible mm -hmm. and um, he was just saying that there are all sorts of examples throughout history of things really seeming to fall apart before they really came together you know that the old story no longer works and therefore the old story is collapsing in order to make room for a new story yeah <clears throat> yeah. yeah so be it so be it yeah yeah Actually, a question finally just came in from a listener. I want to give her the opportunity to yeah. ask, it, ask it to you. Uh, this is Laura from Oregon, and she asks, Hi, um, experiencing you is like experiencing such open fluidity around awakening. I realize that my mind has contracted somewhat around head, heart, gut, and, the, and that idea and my awakening kept looking to that as an expected path. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. She's expecting some head, heart, gut progression or something. But so much of my beingness experiences an unbelievable journey when I watch and rest in awareness. Ooh. Yeah. Can you please speak more on how best to be, in quotes, and invite this awakening journey as you did with the heart? I'm sorry it's very difficult to know how to ask this question about how to assist intelligence to awaken you. Thank you. Oh, just bowing to you, Laura, my goodness, what a beautiful report. And how wise you are just to notice where awareness is drawn. Because that's how it reveals everything to itself. So that's pretty much what we could just play with during the day, is noticing where awareness is drawn and where its gaze rests and what intrigues it. <clears throat> So as unique sages, and especially as modern sages, no outer authority is needed other than your inner resonance. So I invite you also to just notice what resonates and don't touch what doesn't resonate. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if I could just chime in on that, it's, it seems mm -hmm. like... It, we can maps can be useful, but we can get too hung up on them, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can get all sort of expecting things that well, Ramana said this, and Papaji said that, and <laughs> Gangaji said that, and Byron Katie said this, and it's like we're we're kind of losing the the innocent reference to our own experience, and mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. yeah. And your your body is backup discernment and resonance services, because you know. Body doesn't lie. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Beautiful. Okay. Well, thank you very much for hanging in there, Pamela. With oh, thank you. What the... an honor to be with you, Rick, and Irene, and your dog, and also the <clears throat> Sangha that's listening. Hello, hello, I love you. Yeah, there's about 150, 60 people on, um, mm. which is a good, good number. So you're a popular, popular lady. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so I'll just make a couple of concluding remarks that I always make. I've I've been speaking with Pamela Wilson. Um, Pamela, tell us just a bit about what you do and what you offer. I mean, online Skype sessions and you travel around and you know what? Yeah. How can, we've been how can people through, interact with you? Through Open Circle Center in the East Bay of Northern California, we do two um, <clears throat> online satsangs a month generally and mm -hmm. they're just on the telephone mm -hmm. and um, there's if you go to my web page com, there's so many offerings there and um, I love to do one-on-one -on -one sessions because it's so fun to unveil the divine together and that's about it. And you do most of those over okay. Skype I presume? And Skype and also just telephone. And too. telephone right. Yeah. Yeah. And if per in person, I suppose, if someone happens yes. to live in the vicinity. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so I've been to Pamela's site, and you, you can get in touch with her through that and, um, you know, sign up to be notified of things, including getting notified of when her book comes out, because who knows it. When do you think that'll be? Well, it's um, it was turned down by most of the publishers' spiritual imprints in mm -hmm. the U.S. Uh -huh. um, Have you tried New Harbinger? 
No, I haven't tried them, but um, it's now with Ryder uh -huh. in the UK. In okay. the UK, they're passionate about dogs, so we're hopeful that they'll get it. <laughs> Good. I hope they do. And if that falls through, try New Harbinger. They're publishing a lot of my friends' books. Oh, sweet. They want Thanks, me to publish Rick. one, but I can't get around to writing it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thanks, uh, thanks, Pamela, and thanks to all those who've been listening or watching. Go to batgap.com and um, check out the, there's an at-a-glance menu that gives you a summary of everything that's on the site. And, um, you know, see who's scheduled if you look under f upcoming interviews and check out all the old ones. And there's an audio podcast of this if you like to listen to things while you're cutting the grass or something like I do and a donate button, which we appreciate people clicking and enables Irene and I to put so much time into this as we do. Mm -hmm. So, thank you very much. Um, next week I'll be speaking with Jacqueline Maria Longstaff, who's in Denmark and spends half her year in, in India at an ashram in Arunachala, mm -hmm. or Tiruvannamalai, and uh, she looks interesting. I'm just reading mm. her stuff now. So thanks, Pamela. I hope you get over that cough. I know. I'm already much better. Thanks, Good. Rick. Thanks, take, Irene. Take your doggy for a walk. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. We'll much be, love to all. Yeah, love to you. We'll be in touch. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.